So on my way to Spokane, Washington, uh, a couple weeks ago, first time ever been there, um, really loved the dry heat. So much better than humidity. Um, I was on my way home, and I was in uh, O'Hare, Chicago's O'Hare Airport. Anybody been there before? Yeah, okay, so yeah, a lot of you guys. Okay, so I'm looking out the window, and I see an impressive sight. It's a Boeing 737. Um, and yes, I've seen like tons of these before, but it was super close to the window. Actually, I don't even know if it was safe how close that plane was to the window. And I thought to myself, how in the world do we get that thing in the air? Have you ever thought about that before? Okay, these suckers are 90,000 pounds, and that's empty. And we're able to get them off the ground, not just off the ground, but 35,000 feet off the ground. That's pretty impressive. But to me, even more impressive than that is the everlasting God, the creator of the universe who formed the humans, who formed the brains that created and engineered a Boeing 737. These humans that made this flying machine were fully reliant on him for every breath. But God was reliant on no one when he spoke eagles into existence. How truly awesome is that? Not just to see a machine fly, but a living, breathing organism soar. Whereas a 737 uses 85 gallons of fuel per hour, the Golden Eagle, as I learned from the American Eagle Foundation, can soar effortlessly for hours. Although we would love that wonderful ability, there's no way we could step out of this church today and soar like an eagle. Sorry to break it to you. Yet, our perfect God, whose word always proves true, tells us in Isaiah that those who trust in him, those who wait expectantly, patiently on him, will soar high on wings as eagles. Church, our God is ready to supply everything we need to live the impossible life he has called us to. He's ready to do the impossible in and through us so that we can experience his power, his perspective, and his presence in a real way. Graduates, Northridge Church family, are you ready to soar? We don't have to trust and wait on our strength, our circumstances, our resources to just get by. We can trust and wait on the only one who can supply our needs, satisfy our desires, and do what only he can through us to make us more like him, to shine the light of his goodness and love to the world. Church, are you ready to soar? Isaiah 40, 28 through 31 says, Have you not heard? Have you not understood the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth? He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired, and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Amen. This beautiful passage is God's response to an apparent lament of his people. God references that lament in verse 27. O oh, Jacob, how can you say the Lord does not see your troubles? O oh, Israel, how can you say God ignores your right? The book of Isaiah is a pretty uh, sizable book. Um, and it maps out some of the reasons for the trouble that God's people were facing. They... Even the most faithful ones, the people of Judah, had rebelled against God, worshipped other gods, and filled their land with injustice 
and violence. This had led to judgment and would eventually lead to their exile in Babylon. But God, our God, is the same God he's always been. The one who revealed himself to Moses. He is Yahweh, the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy. His people were unfaithful, but he is slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. His people had rebelled and sinned over and over again. But he is the God who forgives iniquity, rebellion, and sin. Hallelujah. The Israels might, the Israelites, Israels, the Israelites might have given up on God, but he was, has, and never will give up on them. Here's his tender words of comfort. I've had it on the screen for a while, uh, so you're familiar with it. Um, Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Tell her that her sad days are gone and that her sins are pardoned. Isaiah also provides good news, not just for Jerusalem, but for other nations, other peoples who would turn from sin and put their trust in God. In Isaiah 19... Uh, Isaiah prophesies that Egypt and Assyria will one day worship God together along with Israel. And then there's Isaiah 25, 6. It's a beautiful picture of this feast. This feast in the new Jerusalem that the Lord of heaven's armies will throw out before all the peoples of the world. Jew and Gentile together unified as one. Isn't that beautiful? The door is open wide through Jesus for all peoples to come and put their trust in the everlasting God. Have you not heard? Have you not understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of earth. He never grows weak or weary. Do you ever get tired? It's kind of a silly question. Isn't it good to know that God never does? Have you ever come to the end of your understanding? Isn't it good to know that no one can measure the depths of his understanding? He's the everlasting God, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the creator of earth. And he's ready to give us power to soar with him, to live the life we were made for with him if we simply put our trust in him. So the word trust uh, translated um, in uh, Isaiah 40, 31 is also translated as wait patiently in Psalm 40. David is a man that has experienced what it's like to wait for God. And he was never put to shame. And David shares this testimony Psalm 40, I waited patiently for the Lord to help me. And he turned and he heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. The same word translated soar high in Isaiah 40, 31 is the word lifted out. Right there that we just read in Psalm 40. Have you ever been there where David was in Psalm 40? Beaten down, so discouraged that you feel like you're in a deep pit? Well, God is ready to to lift us up out of some pits today, church. I believe he's ready to do this for all of us who would wait on him. So what are you waiting on, church? Who are you trusting in today? Who or what are you hoping in for your present, for your future? Are you hoping in your gifts, in your abilities? Are you putting all your trust in a good paying job? Are you waiting on the perfect government leader to usher in a new day? Are you waiting on that vacation, movie, or book to get lost in and forget about the challenges you face? Nothing wrong with any of these things. I'm about ready to go on vacation, so I love that. Love movies, love books, uh, love praying for our leaders, right? 
all these things are great. Good paying jobs are a blessing, right? But if we're putting our trust in them to supply our deepest needs, to satisfy our deepest desires, that's wrongly placed trust. What or who are we placing our trust in to supply our deepest desires, to satisfy our insatiable longings, and to give us the life we were made for? There's nothing or no one that can satisfy our deepest needs, our longings, because the one we need and long for the most is God himself. We were made to know him, the creator of the universe, the one for whom all things are possible. And he says to us today, I believe he says this to us today, every single person here, if you trust me, you will find new strength. You will soar high on wings like eagles. You will run and not grow weary. You will walk and not faint. I want us to think about real quick what it would be like to soar like an eagle. It would be an experience of power like never before to be able to fly and a completely new perspective as you're soaring over the tree line. I don't know about y'all, but for most of my Christian life, I found myself not soaring above the trees, but landlocked with my vision as if looking up at one big tree and saying, Man, this is so impossible. There's no way I could ever soar above that. Why is this? Well, for most of my life as a believer, I have tried to do so much on my own. I've tried to conquer sin on my own. Actually, for over a decade, I was stuck in the same sin pattern. I kept telling God, I'm going to get over this. I'm going to do better for you. But it wasn't until my 20s that the light bulb came on through Pastor Dan, actually, came to my school, shared at a chapel, and I realized through that word that I could not defeat sin on my own, but God was ready to do it through me. He was ready to give me the strength to mount up on wings like eagles and soar with him. In the new freedom that I began to experience, over sin by trusting him in it, I was able to see more clearly what I was made for. I wasn't made for this sin cycle. I was made for a new life in Jesus. Not just victory over sin, but knowing him. Being his friend, being his son. Graduates and church body, God is ready to fill us with his resurrection power so that we would not just make it through life, but that we would thrive. Soaring with God means that in the midst of any storm or stressful situation, you can experience his peace. In the midst of the deepest valleys, you can experience the strength of his joy. In the most frightening moments, you can experience his perfect love that casts out all fear. It means that in the hardest moments of temptation, you can have the strength to choose the, inter- the eternal pleasure of the one who gives you abundant life instead of the fleeting pleasure of sin that will destroy you. Soaring with God means that in the midst of the most devastating physical or emotional wound, his healing power is at work to heal you and those around you that you bring to him. His perfect courage and compassion at work in you causes you to reach out, share his love with those who just like you are desperately lost without him. He's ready to work in us, as we shared last week, beyond what we can ask or imagine. To soar with God is to be filled with his power to live the life that he has called us to and to endure to the end. To soar with God also means to gain a new perspective, his perspective. I love the picture God uses here of an eagle, right? 
not only can eagles soar above the clouds, they also have incredible eyesight and apparently a lot of sass. Look at that eagle with that tongue sticking out. Oh my goodness. Yes, they can see really, really well. Um, they can actually spot small prey like a jackrabbit about a mile away. Over a mile away, actually, as they're soaring through the air. Isn't that crazy? That really puts my 2020 vision to shame. Um, <laughs> I think I still have 2020 vision, hopefully. Um, I'm seeing the screen well right now. I don't know about y'all, uh, but so often my perspective in life is far from a soaring above the trees kind of viewpoint. So many times I can miss the forest for the trees. I can really relate with that sweet woman in God's word, Martha. Anybody with me on that? She was hosting Jesus in her home. In the account in Luke 10, she's frantically working, right? Worried about doing so many things, you know, got the food on the burner. Sorry, no burner. Uh, this was before that. Um, whatever, over the stove, uh, the hot coals or whatever. And so she's just going crazy, right? Um, and she missed the one thing that was the main concern. Her sister Mary had discovered the one thing, and it was the joy of sitting at Jesus' feet and learning from him. Graduates, church family, let's not let the busyness of life crowd the space that we commit to listen at the feet of our dearest love, Jesus. Let's make it our habit to look to him not just in the quiet moments, but as we're going through our day. When we feel overwhelmed by the crazy stuff that life throws at us, let's look to him. Let's let him renew our mind so that we can see circumstances and people like he does. Every year at youth group, we have this thing uh, that we do at the end of the year called game night. Um, and it's a night where uh, we plan out a whole bunch of crazy games, um, have a good old time, uh, eat some food, um, and uh, have a costume contest, which is my favorite part. It's awesome. Um, and uh, for the longest time, though, my perspective on this event was all wrong. I'd put so much pressure on myself to make it perfect that I would miss the whole point of this fun event. Of course, we should seek whatever we do with excellence, right? But for God, not for man. I had let this, though, this pursuit of excellence get to the point that my anxious thoughts were guiding my planning of the event and not my Lord Jesus. What a generous gift from God I received this year, and it was a, per a perspective shift. God helped me see that the event was not this overwhelming mountain of work, that I had to do absolutely perfect for it to be success. But it was a fun event to remind students that they are welcomed into the body of Christ, that they are cherished and dearly loved by God, and that we spend time together as the church. So God is ready to give us a perspective to see circumstances and people the way that he does. We're living in the midst of a world so divided. There's even division in the church. God can help us as the church get above the twigs on the ground, which are the opinions that divide us, to see the forest of facts that unify us. We are the family of God, the body of Christ, all different parts of the same body, all with different backgrounds, different beautiful backgrounds, perspectives, but the same most beautiful Lord and the same hope in him alone to rescue us from our sin so that we can be brought in to this big, beautiful, sometimes awkward and growing family known as the church. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. He calls us up to soar 
with him so that we can see others the way that he does. Not just our family in Jesus, but those who are not a part of the family yet, as Pastor Sam used to say. Those who are lost and without hope unless they enter into a relationship with God through the only way, Jesus. So he's ready to give us perspective to see every human being, every human being, the ones that are your friends, the ones that are your enemies, the ones that you agree with, the ones that you disagree with, the ones that get on your nerves, the ones that you love being around. God is ready to give us his perspective on every human being, and this is what his perspective is. Every human being on this planet is a treasured individual, highly cherished and wildly loved by God. That's what his word tells us. And as he gives us eyes for people around us, he will also fill us with his heart for them. For some of us, that means going across the street. For some of us, that means going across our cubicle or our university campus. Don't jump over your cubicle. That would be dangerous. But for some of us, that might even mean going to the ends of the earth to share the good news of Jesus with those who have not even heard his name yet. Our God has come to rescue us so that we could know him and so that we can soar with him too. Good news, I'm almost done. Experiencing God's presence. Our God, the everlasting God, the creator of the earth, is not a distant God. Amen, church? For those of us that have put our trust and our hope in Jesus to rescue us from sin so that we could be with him, he is Emmanuel, God with us. That's in the book of Isaiah too. Check it out. This is the name that Isaiah gave to the Messiah who would bring forgiveness and reconciliation. This Messiah, our King Jesus. And as we talked about last week, he can do anything and he is with us always. Are you ready to experience his power, his perspective, and his presence in a real way? We don't have to trust and wait on our strength, our circumstances, our resources to just get by. We can trust and expectantly wait on the one who supplies our needs, satisfies our desires, and does what only he can do through us to make us more like him so that we can know him and shine the light of his goodness and love to a world in desperate need of him. Church, are you ready to soar 